Hey guys, welcome back. We're still in unit 3.1, which is ecosystem stability and change. And we are looking at part two, factors that limit population growth. We're gonna talk a little bit about what limiting factors are, talk about the um, types of factors that affect population growth, and then we'll even talk a little bit about human population growth. All right, so you guys ready? Let's go. The first thing we want to do is mention something called limiting factors. Now, what limiting factors are? They're fa they are factors that cause population growth to decrease. So it's going to slow down the growth of a population or completely, you know, instead of growing in size, it might make it go negative, meaning it's going to decrease in size each year. There are two types, two categories of limiting factors, the density dependent factors, as well as density independent factors. We're gonna talk about both of those in just a moment. All right, so now we talked about that. Let's jump on to our density dependent factors. So these are limiting factors that actually depend on the size of the population, meaning that as the population size gets bigger, you see these limiting factors having a greater effect on them. Most of these do tend to be biotic factors, so they're caused by other living things within the ecosystem. There are four types, competition, predation, parasitism, and disease. We're gonna discuss each one of these right now. So the first one is competition. And what this, what competition is, is organisms are fighting for resources. So the more individuals that live in one area, the sooner that they, they can actually use up resources. So the more individuals in one area means that you have more individuals to feed, more individuals who need space to grow and reproduce. And we do tend to see this both within members of the same population or species, as well as members of different population or species. So if we look down here, bottom left, we have a zebra carcass likely killed by lions, and then that's the leftovers. And we have competition between the hyena and the vulture. Now, both of them are scavengers. They both want to eat from that zebra carcass question is who's going to go first now they're both in competition whoever goes first gets access to as much of it as they want they could even not leave any for the other similarly i'm going to move my camera up here in the top right we have competition for food so we have a groundhog and birds and you can see there's active competition going on. The groundhog has some nuts or seeds in its hand and trying to eat it. And the birds are trying to take it right out of its hands. So they're competing for that food. Now when it's between members of different species, like both of those examples, we call it interspecific competition. And that just means, again, competition between different species. You can also have competition within members of the same species. Over here on the top left, we have a bunch of, I believe they're barnacles. And the barnacles are competing for space. When they attach to the rock, they are attached there for the rest of their life. Now they want a good spot where they get a lot of flow from water because they're filter feeders. So they need water flowing in order to pick out the little things that are floating in the water. They're gonna compete for good spots where there's good water flow, because the more water flow they have, then the more food they will get. And down here, we have two, I think they're elk, and they are competing for the right to mate. So whichever one of these males wins this battle of wills and antlers, that's the one that will get the right to mate with a female who's nearby. Now, when, it's mem when there's competition between members of the same species, we call it intraspecific competition, competition within the same species. Now, when it's between different species, 
they, we have found that this is actually a major force behind evolution because whichever species has the best adaptations is the one that's going to get more resources, survive longer, and have more offspring that have the same traits that it had. So then those traits would, uh, over many generations, eventually go to all members of the population. But again, let's say this is all based on population size. If there aren't that many barnacles, if they have a small population size, they're not going to be competing for space because there's less barnacles that need to attach to that rock. If there are less males, then that means they're not going to be as much competition between them for the females. If there are less birds, then they probably won't feel comfortable going one-on-one -on -one with the groundhog. And so the groundhog is going to get all the food to himself. I mean, come on, look, there's four birds ganging up on one groundhog. So the larger populations are, the more competition there will be. Predation. What predation is, is when one organism will actually seek out and eat another organism. The one that is doing the seeking or the hunting is the predator, and what it is eat eating is the prey. So here, top left, we have a great white shark preying on a seal or sea lion. Here we have the leopards going after maybe water buffalo. Here we have ants preying on whatever's underneath them. I can't really tell. Maybe a young cicada. And up here, we have a panda eating some bamboo. Remember, the definition of predation is one organism seeking and eating another organism. This panda sought out and ate another organism. Bamboo is a plant. It is an organism. We generally don't think of herbivores as predators, but they are predators to plants. Now what they found is that this predator-prey relationship is actually a form of population control to keep either population from getting out of control, out of hand, and thus disrupting the entire ecosystem. Use the example of deer and wolves, because this is actually a real life example that was an experiment that was conducted on, I believe it's called Royal Island. So the deer population on this island was getting larger. They had no predators to um, stabilize the population. And what a lot of scientists and ecologists were worried about is if the deer population stayed unchecked, then... <laughs> then they would eventually eat up all the greenery and all the producers and that can have devastating effects on the rest of the ecosystem because now there's not enough producers to support the ecosystem so what they did was they introduced just a few wolves and what they noticed is there was you know a couple thousand deer there at this point so you only have a couple or a few wolves and a lot of deer well we have a lot of our prey so that meant that the wolves can pretty much eat whenever they wanted so what we what the scientists noticed is that the wolf population started to increase because there was abundant food in the deer so the wolf population increased so they now had more wolves to feed which meant that the deer population started going down. When the deer population got to a certain point, the wolf population can no longer survive in terms of that sheer, the larger population. So some of the wolves died due to starvation and that caused the wolf population to go down. Well, now that there's less wolves to feed, the deer population started going up again. So you notice this kind of balancing act between the predator and prey populations. Neither one getting out of control. Yes, they're both constantly in flux, but it's like a teeter-totter. You're fine on either end as long as you keep going up and down. 
no one is flying off the handle or getting, you know, rammed into the ground. So it's this nice, delicate balance within this predator-prey relationship. Next is parasitism. I mean, so you can see all the glorious parasites and all their wonderful glory. So these limit population growth because they take nourishment or resources at the expense of a host. Now, some of the examples here are, here's a tick. The tick has its head burrowed in the skin of maybe a dog or a deer, unsure at this point. Now the tick, let's say it's stuck to a deer. It is taking nutrients from the host, which is the deer, and that means that the deer can be harmed by this. Now, if this one deer here has a parasite like a tick on it, but it's a small population of deer, so this deer's kind of, you know, just meandering on its own, there's not as much of a chance for it to pass that parasite on to another deer. However, if it's a larger population, so instead of just one deer, so here's our population, you see these two deer, they're just kind of meandering about, but they're not necessarily in the same part of the area at one time because there's lots of space to spread out. Since they don't really come in contact with each other, this one cannot pass the parasite onto this one. However, if you have a larger population of deer, then they're in closer proximity because the population density is greater. So now this one can pass a parasite onto multiple other deer. And as these ones are moving around, they come in contact with this group. And now the parasite gets passed on to this group. So that's why parasitism is a limiting or a density dependent factor. Because the more individuals there are in the population, the denser the population, the closer in proximity you live with each other, and the easier it is to pass on a parasite from one to the next. Here we see that there is a type of parasite that will actually go into certain fish's mouths. It will eat their tongue and then it will attach to where the tongue was and it will act like a tongue, meaning it will just kind of sit there. But it's a parasite because when the fish eats food, you notice the little heads of the parasites are right there, they get first dibs at the food. So not as much of the food goes to the fish, which means the fish can be malnourished and die. Top left, we have um, heartworms. So if you've had a pet, specifically a dog, maybe even a cat, a lot of times they'll ask, the vet will have you take a once monthly heartworm medication for your pet. And what it does is it prevents this. Heartworms are a parasite that can be transmitted via mosquitoes, dog or dog poop from an already infected dog or another poop from an infected animal, among other ways. Once it gets into their system, like if they eat it or if it gets transmitted through the mosquito, it, the eggs and the larva get into the bloodstream. Then the bloodstream carries them to the heart where they take up residence and they'll just keep growing and reproducing. Now they're taking nutrients out of the blood, but as they're growing and reproducing, eventually they can actually overgrow the heart. Um, here we have a nest. I think this is either because of a cuckoo or a kiwi, but what happens is certain bird species will actually lay their eggs in other birds' nests. This way, the other bird, the other mama, mama bird, will raise their chick as its own. And oftentimes that can mean either pushing some of the other eggs out or just being louder than the other baby so that it gets all the food. And last one is disease. Now this is very, very similar to how parasites spread. So if one, or one member of a population has a disease and it's a small population, so they're more spread out, it's not as likely to pass it on to another member of that species. But if it's a larger population, then we tend to see it spread 
more quickly. It's kind of like when the code, the code virus, you notice kind of like no one in the school has it and a couple kids are out sick because they had the code. And then now we have a lot of kids out sick because of the code virus or the flu. It's the same idea because in school, we're all, you know, super close together. We're in com these confined classrooms together, very close. We are breathing out the water vapor that can contain the virus within it. And then we're bringing it in or breathing it in or, you know, touching desks and then touching our faces. And we're very easily transmitting it from one person to another. Well, that's because we are in this large population in close proximity to each other. So the larger a population is, then the quicker diseases can be spread from one individual to another. And here I show some examples of diseases. Um, I don't remember the names of all of them. This one down here on the bottom left is mad cow disease. This one on the bottom, sorry, bottom right is mad cow. Bottom left is similar to mad cow. It's a, um, it is a prion disorder, just like mad cow. There's one that affects deer more often, and that's that one. This is mange, I believe, for this poor little fox. And I'll be honest, I don't know what disease this one is. I, could be a cancer or tumor, um, which in which case it wouldn't necessarily be inherited or passed on. But I don't think that's what it was. I think it was something else that was causing these, some infection that was causing these growths on the deer. At least when I looked them up, I made these PowerPoints a little while ago, so I don't remember exactly what I typed in to search for my images. All right, now let's talk about density independent factors. Now these are limiting factors that will affect all the populations in a given area, not just the large populations. Remember, with the population dependent, um, the density dependent factors, we saw that they had bigger effects on larger populations. Well, with density independent, it's going to affect all populations, regardless of their size. So it's going to affect big populations and small populations equally. The reason why they um, affect all populations is because they tend to be abiotic factors that will affect the entire ecosystem, such as unusual weather, natural disasters, seasonal cycles, human activities, etc. Um, what they could result in a population crash, which means that, you know, the population is increasing or pretty high, and then you have a massive drop off. So a lot of individuals can die all at once, but it does, as, as long as there's some individuals left, the population can regrow and they, whatever adaptations allowed some of them to survive, then that will be passed on to the offspring of the next generation and will allow them, you know, a better chance of survival the next time one of these density independent factors come around. So let's start talking about them. First, we have unusual weather. So we can have things like hurricanes, extreme droughts, tornadoes, um, lizards where you wouldn't necessarily expect them. And those are palm trees and that's snow. Or there is such a thing called a fire tornado, kind of, or fire tornado, or fire tornado, however you want to call it. Kind of scary though. So all of these things, because they're going to affect the entire area, like for instance, with the droughts, everything is going to dry up. So that's going to cause plants to die, which is then going to cause the herbivores to die, which is going to cause the carnivores to die. And it's just going to disrupt everything in the ecosystem. It's not just going to affect the large populations, when the hurricane is swirling and creating these massive storms that lead to flooding, they don't only flood areas where there's a large population of deer, they flood areas where there is just any kind of population. It's not like the water says, oh, we're gonna go here because there's a larger population of deer than there is over here. So we're not gonna flood there. We're gonna only flood here. No, it's 
abiotic factor, it's not concerned. Weather is not concerned with populations. It's just a matter of the forces that come together, temperatures, et cetera, that lead up to these big events. Natural disasters, so things like volcano erupting, we have an earthquake, tsunami, or here's a forest fire. So these are these big massive events that once again, is going to affect the entire area. It's not just going to affect some individuals in the area. When that lava is coming down the mountain and flowing down, it's not going to purposely ignore certain species of plants or animals because there's only a few of them in that area. No, it's just going to keep flowing and burning everything in its path. Seasonal cycles. So for some places, it's, um, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter. It could be a rainy season versus a dry season. And some areas also have dry seasons that lead to natural wildfire seasons. In these particular areas, those are normal, and a lot of times, then there are the organisms that live in these areas are adapted to these changes. So, for instance, you have um, certain types of rabbits whose fur changes color depending on the season. So, they create certain pigments in the summer or in spring, which allow their fur to become brown, <clears throat> and then they stop making those in the fall so that when winter comes their fur is white. You have some trees whose seeds need fire in order to germinate. That Their seeds will not start to grow into new trees until the intense heat of a fire has gone through the area. <sighs> and we have certain human activities such as we build a dam or we clear cut a forest or mining, we have pollution here. And the reason why is because once again, these are going to affect the entire area. Here, we are actually getting rid of entire sections of a rainforest ecosystem. So since we're getting rid of that ecosystem, that is going to affect every population of that ecosystem that lived in those areas. Same with the dam. This was a river at one point dammed it up, now we have a lake on one side and the aquatic organisms like the fish that lived on this side of the river, they no longer have access to water so they die. So again, a lot of these still have effects on every population in the ecosystem because it's affecting the whole ecosystem as a whole. All right, let's talk a little bit about human population. Now, the interesting thing about he the human population is that for most of our history, we, our population actually grew extremely slowly. And that's for a few different reasons. First, food was scarce. Um, we weren't really all that good at agriculture when we first started it. You know, practice makes perfect. Disease ran rampant. We didn't know about antibiotics or even to how to properly sterilize equipment. Um, and the childhood's survival rate was very, very, ugh, only about half of all children survived to adulthood. So what you would notice is that families tended to have more children because if only half of them are going to survive, then you want to have more kids to increase the likelihood that you have some that do survive and make it to adulthood. But it was roughly about 500 years ago, give or take, when the population began to grow more rapidly. It started to grow more exponentially. And we noticed that there's a few um, things that occurred around that time. One of them being that our food supply became more reliable. So farming, we got, you know, became really great at that. Plus also moving food supplies from one area to another. So food transports. We improved sanitation. Um, for a while, you know, in, before there was indoor plumbing, you had a little chamber pot. You did your business in the chamber pot. And then you just threw the contents of the chamber pot out the window into the street. 
sucked if you were beneath the window as the chamber pot was being emptied. But human waste has a lot of different bacteria in it and that can lead to rises in certain diseases. Uh, medicine got better. We start treating illnesses with things other than leeches. We also cleaned instruments before we did surgeries. A lot of people's in wars and battle for a while. It wasn't the, their wounds that killed them. It was the resulting infections because we didn't know how first we didn't have antibiotics to get rid of the infection, but also when they would do surgeries to remove bullets or to amputate limbs, they didn't sterilize the equipment. So for us nowadays, it's, you know, common knowledge, you know, use heat or alcohol to make sure there's nothing, no microbes on the blade. But they didn't know that back then. So it's like, do a surgery over here, just, you know, rinse it with water, do a surgery over here. There was no uh, sterilization. So it was very easy to pass um, microbes to different people. And that caused infection with that, which then led to death. Now, what occurred is our birth rates still remained high. People were, you know, still used to having lots of kids, so they continued to have lots of kids. However, the childhood survival increased a lot. So instead of that slow, you know, population growth because of half of all children dying, more kids were surviving and people were living longer due to medicine, food, and sanitation. So what we noticed is that humans started going through exponential growth. Now we are going to see a picture of this later, but we are still currently experiencing exponential growth. And right now there's a lot of questions about future growth rates for, hu for the human population. Um, different types of scientists and um, sociologists have been looking at age structure diagrams and charts looking at how diseases move, et cetera, because they're trying to figure out, will the human species continue at our current exponential rate of you know, increasing our population, or will it move towards a demographic transition? So that's more when you switch from exponential growth to logistics and kind of you know, balance out. The reason for that is because there are some problems for continued population growth. Where are we gonna put all the people? How are we gonna feed them all? How are we gonna provide medicine for everyone? So there are some questions about what's gonna happen if, we, if our current growth rate stays on this current trend of being exponential. Now I love this chart or this graph. It is to me simply you know, incredible. And this only talks about you know, between zero and 5.6 billion individuals. And it's starting at the year 15,000 BC. Here is the year zero, switching over to AD, and this goes to the year 2000. Now again, from 15,000 BC, you notice it's very, very, very low population. Around 9,000 BC is when we domesticated animals and plants. Then around between six and 5,000 BC is when we start basing our societies on agriculture, it became less nomadic. Notice it's still kind of increasing, increasing slowly though. It's a very, very low um, slope. Notice this dip right here. We have a, a very, very distinct dip right there. It's thought that's likely when the bubonic plague, the Black Death, hit Europe and killed off an insane amount of people, a large percentage of the population at that time. So that large, or that disease, which caused such a large death rate, actually made an indention here in the growth. But then we hit the industrial and scientific revolution. So that's when medicine got better, agriculture got better, sanitation got better, everything got better. And then look at the growth rate after that. Almost vertical at that point. 
So we see that again, very, very slow at first until we hit that industrial and scientific revolution. Then sharp increase because people were living longer, but we were still having lots of kids and those kids were living longer. So now we saw greater growth in terms of our population. That moves back. All right, let's go ahead and talk about some additional resources now. First, we have science in pajamas, and we have one explaining density dependent factors, as well as one on density independent factors. For our other videos, we have course hero population limiting factors. We have Khan Academy population regulation. We have the American Museum of Natural History, human population through time. This is one is actually pretty cool. I definitely recommend you guys checking this one out. And then Bozeman Science, human population size. All right. So these are just some extra resources that can kind of help to explain thing, what we've talked about in new and different ways, provide some more visuals. Um, but yeah, I'll post a link for this presentation in our video description. In the meantime, you guys, if you have questions, you know where to find me, and just have a great day. Take care of yourselves, all right? All right, stay safe and healthy. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.